Recording in progress. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Cool. cool. So we're, we're just getting uh, the slides ready to go. So give us. Yes, absolutely. The, the usual uh, internet issues. Uh, yes. So he, he's yes. having trouble logging onto the Wi Fi. So. I, can, I can see myself now. Okay. Uh, Hi, Amelia. Uh, um, um, so uh, do we do, um, do I close down my video perhaps? I don't know if this is so the remote participants should be using video. Kind of weird, isn't it? Are you not getting on? Yeah, it's sort of like could you? Hi, Renata. Hi, Andres. Uh, well, you could reset the computer, or you, could you use Renata's computer? Put your slides on Renata's email. Uh, I have a USB. So maybe could he just use your computer and log in the room? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. I don't know. I mean, otherwise, he could put the slides on his computer. We could do the next, next, next. Uh, Harry, can I ask before we get going, um, is it um, the case that uh, he will
civil society feel more afraid of or distant, distant from our daily activism. Uh, my name is Renata Avila and I'm the CEO of the Open Knowledge Foundation. I also co-founded a um, um, platform for experts called Polylat and I uh, have been around in the internet rights community for over almost two decades. And one of the issues that we never, never, never uh, uh, activated in our communities is the issue of finance. And now, more than ever, you know, with the promises that we hear, like usually empty promises that we hear that we are going to connect to finance services the next billion, and we, we are going to do, like, you know, truly democratize with the, with the uh, assistance of... Uh, digitization, we will just lift out of poverty, lots of people with e-banking and all of that. I, I feel that it is still missing uh, the, the part of us taking a, an empowered stance on that, on being really able to use our data, our banking data, uh, to imagine better financial futures, to really be participants and not just passive recipients of whatever the bank on the other side or the financial institution on the other side dictates. Um, we lost a lot of confidence if, you, if we think of money and, and uh, in the crisis of 2008. And as we are, like it seems, heading to yet another crisis, but we are the most connected generation ever in the planet, even if we have to recognize that a lot are not connected. We are facing new uh, opportunities that uh, we need to be prepared to seize. And, but also roads in the block that keep us away from seizing those opportunities. One is the data about money. And um, as, uh, as the CEO of Open Knowledge Foundation, I face, you know, there's no more data, uh, not, not, there's basically not uh, entity richer in data than banks. They are not only rich in money, they are very rich in data, in granular data about everything we do. Just tracing your credit card will, will tell a lot of things about your life. And there, is, there has been, like over the decades, there has been this, this separation of, there's, it's, it's a deliberate opaque system because it has its own regulations, its own standards, its own procedures. I mean, you don't, you don't feel, uh, personally, I feel the moment I feel more distant from an institution is the moment I have to deal with my bank. Uh, it is the distance, the coldness, the complexity. And when you read the financial news, you feel the same uh, distance. And the, pur the purpose of this, uh, of this panel is to combine many problems that we have seen in the last 10 years. Economic inequality, financial inequality, democratic deficit, a deficit on transparency, and the urgent need to be actors in shaping the future we want, and not just passive recipients on whatever is dictated by the big institutions. Um, it also explores, in a new twist, what we can do with technology and, we, wh and what we can do as civil society or a, 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 even as a multi-stakeholder group organize to break these monopolies of finance and to really incorporate the power of technology, our power of our technologies in what we do. So um, I'm joined by uh, two wonderful speakers and a wonderful moderator that is remote. Uh, uh, with Andres Arauz, uh, who's an economist. Uh, he, he did his PhD in this precise topic, and he's also an advi advisor of NIM Technologies. And Harry Halpin, who's an academic and activist. I think, that he, uh, I think that he has been to how many IGFs? He will tell us. So many. Uh, using different roles, I mean, uh, as activist, academic, and also the founder and CEO of NIM Technologies. And um, as an uh, online moderator is Amel Amelia Anders' daughter. She was uh, one of the youngest parliamentarians in the European Parliament and one standing for these possibilities of this democratic future. So without, the, uh, after this very long uh, preamble, uh, let's go to the core of the discussion. Let's uh, listen to what Andres has to say on how to unlock the power of money uh, and unlock the opportunities of the finance, uh, finance future for all. 
Thank you, Renata. Thank you to everyone uh, here, both online and in person. Uh, I'd like to tell you um, a story and end up with a, a proposal, uh, which is uh, what we should do about perhaps one of the richest data sets that we'll find uh, about our lives, which is the data of money, the data of our financial transactions. And to begin with, uh, I'd like to uh, make a really, really brief presentation on how a payment system works and uh, all the data that comes uh, incorporated in it. So when you do a, a financial transaction, and uh, I don't know if you can help me project the, the slides on the screen for everyone here in person, um, we have a person that's a sender that has uh, an account at their own bank. Then uh, the person uh, at, at that bank, if the receiver is at the same bank, it will be a very easy transaction, and all you need is one bank for two people, right? If we share the same bank, the bank will be in charge of uh, settling that transaction, and it can probably even happen in real time. It becomes a bit more difficult when you have uh, two banks. So I have my account at one bank, you have at another bank. We're going to need a third bank, which is a correspondent bank. And that correspondent bank usually is a central bank if we are within the domestic system. And because of the deregulation of uh, capital flows around the world, when it's an international transaction, that correspondent bank is usually a foreign financial institution. Now, when you order the transaction, you have to accompany a lot of data, the, 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 the account number, the address, the uh, identifying information, and so on. And that becomes part of a uh, database, right? That, that, that there's a, a storage of that information that uh, gets uh, uh, that gets kept in one of these uh, correspondent banks and also in the in the local banks. So this increase of information due to the financial transactions becomes a huge database uh, that uh, the bank and the banks can see for everybody involved and for other account holders and non-account holders, but each of us individually can only see our own transactions, right? So there's an asymmetry of information which derives into an asymmetry of power. I can only see my accounts and my information about my transactions, but the bank, this entity, can see the accounts, the information, the transactions of millions of other people. And if you think about this internationally, there are only very few correspondent banks around the world, and they have been especially grouped into the Wolfsburg Group, 13 largest correspondent banks in the world. They have the information for you know, billions of people, of legal entities, of corporations, and so on. So we have an, a great problem in terms of information asymmetry. And what is done with that information? Well, we have seen that there is a way where people can avoid uh, having all this information be sucked into the large financial system, and it's dealing with cash. With cash, the transaction is bilateral. It's not triangular. You don't have an intermediary, right? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a simultaneous transaction with a physical paper. And, of course, there are many institutions that have been grouped into, uh, in this case, an, an alliance that you may have heard of, Better Than Cash Alliance, whose foundational members, founding partners, are the institutions that you see on the screen. And they have tried to influence policy around the world so that cash is basically uh, pushed aside and that international transactions via electronic payments and financial institutions come to the forefront. One of their objectives, as stated, for example, by the MasterCard Foundation, is how to convert, not, not just uh, in, in the sense of facilitating the life of people, but how to convert all that data around financial transactions into new profit-making uh, businesses, okay? And into a useful tool for surve surveillance purposes. And this is what I'm going to go into next. So you can imagine the scale of the data derived from each of our transactions. And the thing is, it's not stored in some imaginary cloud somewhere. The big providers of 
the data of money, so financial transactions, their data servers are not in each of our individual countries. I'm talking from the perspective of the global south. Visa, for example, has their data center exclusively in the US. Only very, very recently did they open another data center in Europe. But the entire world's transaction, so you may be in Singapore and making a, a purchase in Ethiopia, but the data center for where that transaction will be stored is in the United States. And this is a very key example that I'm showing you on screen because in 2005, so a long time ago, a Canadian consumer that was buying medicinal marijuana in, the in Canada, but using Visa, which is a United States company that stores their data in the United States, was concerned that they may be red flagged because they were doing something legal in Canada, paying legally, but would be illegal in the United States. So Canada started an inquiry into why the data of Canadian citizens using Canadian banking providers uh, and purchasing in a Canadian business store the data in the United States, but that doesn't end there. Sure, maybe it's in a corporate data center, but the Patriot Act, the United States Patriot Act, allows the government to have direct access to the visa data center for their purposes, national security purposes. This didn't end there. A few years later, in the Snowden revelations, uh, the uh, Der Spiegel, uh, a German uh, uh, magazine, newspaper, published uh, that the NSA, the National Security Agency of the United States, had direct access to the credit card networks and to the SWIFT international transfer network, okay? So the problem that we saw in the first slide, which is that banks have this asymmetry of information and therefore power over all of us, doesn't end there. It so happens that one government in the world can also tap into that information. I haven't heard of the Central Bank of Ethiopia tapping the Visa card networks or, you know, the <laughs> National Security Agency of Peru in Latin America having access to the SWIFT network. It is only one country that legally or illegally through these back doors and has access to the entire world's uh, credit card transaction networks and international transfer transaction networks. And the evidence doesn't stop there. You can see the, the documents that were leaked uh, by Snowden where uh, they explain with uh, a lot of detail how they retain the bulking in transactional data and how they use it for intelligence purposes. In this case, they have access to in data from financial institutions in the Middle East, Pakistan, Zimbabwe, and Kenya, and the entire credit card network from around the world. They use uh, uh, the, the lingo for this in the intelligence community is FININT for financial intelligence. And, and they explain that, you know, with the software that the NSA developed and the GH. Uh, uh, CQ also developed with them, you can put in, you know, a, a phone number and then it links to your, your financial account data, or you can just put in your credit card number or even your traveler code and it reveals all of that information, okay? Uh, so, uh, as you can see, these are documents uh, from the NSA and uh, the TrackFin databases have basically all of this information of not only citizens of the US, but the entire planets. Now, this, doesn't, this didn't end there. Uh, a few uh, uh, months ago, actually, less a bit more than a year ago, you had protests in Canada against uh, uh, the, some of the COVID policies organized by uh, truckers. And uh, in, in Canada, an emergency uh, decree was, was issued, an executive order was issued that basically allowed for the freezing of the uh, accounts of the protesters. So you can see the power that surveillance over the data of money can have over popular mobilization. Now, I'm not judging whether the reason to protest is correct or not, but ignore that for a second. The fact that they can freeze the accounts as a, a way of threatening mobilization of people is uh, extremely uh, dangerous, I think. And 
This is an analysis most recently published. This is actually this month by the uh, Canadian uh, Public Order Emergency Commission set by the Canadian Parliament, where they analyze how much they got to freeze. And it's that the top two uh, pink and orange uh, rows there, flows, they were able to freeze basically most of their money uh, that was destined via these crowdfunding campaigns to the uh, protesters. But it doesn't end there. Now the technology is available so that you can also do surveillance on the blockchain, on the different kinds of cryptocurrencies, which are, of course, transparent and available on the blockchain. And for example, there's a private firm called Chainalysis, which you may have heard of, that specializes not only in macro analysis of uh, the, 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 the amount, the money that is moved around in blockchains and of the different cryptocurrencies, but they can do uh, basically uh, uh, you know, reverse engineering, and they can analyze uh, with sophisticated uh, tools, but which are not too difficult to arrive to, uh, the degree of the movement of money within the blockchains uh, as well. And this is the most recent uh, revelation by the United States Senate, that it is not only the NSA that had access to the credit card in SWIFT and other networks, but also the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, this is the, a, a huge power asymmetry where uh, sometimes uh, people in the civil society have concerns over government surveillance, but here we have to make sure that we understand that it's not just any government or a small government or a local government that's doing surveillance. The asymmetry of information is such that it is basically one government the U.S. government that has surveillance over the data of money of the entire planet's uh, population. And this was, uh, this was uh, basically uh, sanctified by the European Union when they approved a, a special directive that allowed only that government to have access to the SWIFT database. Okay, so the European Union approved a specific legislation to allow that specific government to have access to a very powerful database, which is all of the international transactions in the world. They haven't shared that database with the government in Africa or in Latin America or anywhere in the global south, but only with one government, uh, which is the US. Now, this is very important. Now, how is this done? Well, because when you message, when you do a financial transaction, you have to attach some important data elements. This data, these data elements have been undergoing a process of standardization. And uh, most recently, the ISO 222 has been issued where they basically require what kinds of variables, what kinds of data should be uh, uh, collected when a transaction is ordered, standardized, and then shared in these uh, large platform systems that, that I have already explained. Now, this is important because there are standards and there's a standardization of surveillance. And uh, that's also something we have to uh, be concerned about and look up. This is also aided by a, a huge push, especially in the 21st century, especially since 2001, by this very unaccountable, undemocratic, and ineffective organism, which isn't even created by an international treaty, only an informal mechanism called the FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force, which issues recommendations on what they're called anti-money laundering, terrorist financing uh, regulations or standards. And uh, they, they say that basically uh, they are concerned that CBDCs, central bank digital currencies that are being uh, promoted in, in national uh, governments and central banks more recently may pose a risk if they resemble cash because cash cannot be surveilled, right? So they're saying we have to really think about this if we want to allow anonymous transactions just like cash. Well, we think that privacy is a, is a human right and it's important that uh, there is data protection and privacy. And the FATF does leave a little bit of ground saying, well, we still have to think about CBDCs. If they are going to resemble cash, if they're going to resemble physical bills and coins, how do we design it in such a way that it preserves those characteristics as well? The ITU has said, we have this issue as well. 
they can be designed with a complete uh, AML FATF standards, just like a bank account, or we can make them more like physical cash. What should we do? Technologically speaking, how should we design CBDCs? How should the hardware and the software be designed so that it more closely resembles physical cash rather than a conventional bank account? The IMF issued a, a paper a few months ago explaining what happened to the Bahamas, uh, which was on the gray list of the FATF. And they said, you have to improve your monitoring. And they uh, came up with a CBDC in Bahamas, uh, but with very strict AML controls following FATF recommendations. And after they did that, they were removed from the gray list. So it's not a trivial issue. And the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, has also said uh, that uh, this is a major issue that has to be dealt with in the design of a central bank uh, digital currency. Uh, how should the architecture be designed so that uh, it is uh, more closely resembling physical cash? The, central, the European Central Bank has also said that they are uh, very worried about the issue of privacy because it's the prime, prime concern of European uh, society and it's an ongoing discussion there as well. And this is a very important point. There is already a technical discussion ongoing in the world, but the Global South countries are not included in that discussion. It is only a discussion of the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve in the United States, maybe some other few actors, of course, the large private transnational banks, but they're doing it in an international framework, which is the ISO. We all know the ISO sets the standards after large deliberations, but the global South countries are absent from that discussion. The Technical Committee of Financial Services, the ISO, is discussing central bank digital currencies without the presence of global South countries. We need a wake-up call. We need global South countries to join the ISO working group on central bank digital currencies to put their concerns about mass surveillance about unilateral mass surveillance, and also to protect and uh, defend the rights of their citizens, right? So they're very active on discussing the CBDC, but no global South country is present there. And for example, you can see uh, one of the standards that's being developed right now, uh, the 23526 security aspect for digital currency, which is precisely dealing with trust the binding liability issue and privacy, okay? For, for what? For fiat digital currencies, that means for central bank digital currencies, which are going to replace physical cash perhaps in a decade or two, okay? So we have to have a prospective vision. This is something that deserves uh, attention. CBDC should be carved out from the FATF standards. Privacy and sovereignty should be embedded in the CBDC technology. A law is not enough. A regulation is not enough. A promise from a politician is not enough. We need the technology to make sure that the technological standard covers this issue. And we need the Global South civil society, privacy activists, the cryptocurrency community, everybody who has a stake in the evolution of central bank digital currencies to join and actively participate in the ISO Technical Committee 68. This is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Andres. And before we go ahead, we have, um, uh, with Harry, uh, we have a, a quick announcement from our remote moderator. I will give the floor to Amelia. Thank you so much, Renata. Um, I will uh, keep my uh, video turned off for now. So I've already put it in the meeting chat that if you are a remote-only participant and you would like to post a question to one of the um, panelists, you can either put Q in the meeting chat or raise your Zoom hand, and me and Renata will coordinate to ensure that you are given um, the right time to speak. Um, uh, I also uh, uh, see immediately a deviance from the system. Um, I have one comment in the chat and one uh, raised hand for the raised hand um, proceeding. Uh, so, Renata, if you could give the word to Chris. Hear that uh, question, if that's okay. Uh, 
Um, so we can. I think Chris Odo was first. Um, Chris Odo raised his hand before the question was posted. So I think this is the correct order. So I'll go with ahead with that question and then and then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can okay. hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Odu. I'm actually an ISOC IGF um, Youth Ambassador. Good. So I thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, going through it, I see that we have we still having a lot of issues whereby uh, developing countries are not giving this conversation. I would like to know how do we, uh, developing countries, start having these conversations and giving our own input because it seems it's only uh, more of our European uh, countries and even. Um, uh, North American region that is actually having such a uh, dominance. So how do we come into this uh, conversation? How do we come into this space? That's the first thing. And the second thing I would just like to make a comment on is also, I think um, we're still having issues also surrounding the education on uh, blockchain itself. A lot of people still think blockchain is only cryptocurrencies, uh, whereas that's not the, the case. Uh, blockchain on its own have a, a lot of use cases. It actually solves issues of trust. So I think uh, we're still lacking in the education uh, side of blockchain, which I think it could be a conversation also, which we should be having on how to educate people more on uh, blockchain itself. Yeah, that's my own input. Thank you very much. I will uh, give the, the space for Andres to answer. And I, I guess that Harry can also include the response in his interventions. Uh, so over to you, Andres. Thank you. Just briefly, you can, you can join the discussion with... Uh, you know, spreading the messages that uh, we're trying to uh, uh, convey here at the IGF. But um, in the technical discussion, I invite you to uh, join the ISO Technical Committee 68 work, uh, working group and the, in the Technical Committee itself uh, through your national standard setting body, which is a member of the ISO. It's usually the standards agency in, in each of our countries. And uh, they have to allow you to go in. It's a very... A, a nominally open process. Uh, it's supposed to be democratic, but the problem is it's opaque. So here we want to get rid of that opaqueness, make it transparent, and show you that there is an open door. The problem is they have never told us that the door is open. The door is open and we have to go and we have to participate. And of course, we're going to start uh, trying to activate some uh, uh, people in different countries of, uh, of the world, the Global South, developing countries, to join that, that initiative. On the blockchain question, uh, I'll defer to Harry and, and also to have him explain. Yeah, yeah so I'll, I'll take the blockchain question uh, really quickly, which is you know, blockchain technologies, all they are fundamentally are cryptographically time-stamped records where you cannot remove a record or fake a record. So that's, of course, very useful for financial data, but could be useful for many other things. And I do think the most interesting thing about blockchain technologies, as opposed to, let's say, traditional Silicon Valley big tech, you know, if you look at Silicon Valley, uh, big tech, you know, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, they are mostly controlled by uh, people uh, particularly white men from the United States. If you look at cryptocurrency, people working in that field, it is there is still a lot of control, but you see, you know, CZ running Binance. You see huge amounts of activity in Africa, Paxful. Uh, it's much more diverse globally, um, and so I do think there's some hope there. That one thing that we've never seen happen, which I hope could come from this, is that we bring together some of these cryptocurrency technologists and blockchain technologists together with governments and the activists from the global south in order to make sure that they have sovereignty over their financial system. Um, I think that may answer your question. Is, is there another question or do I, do should it? There's just a comment, and I guess that you can address it as well, uh, from uh, Dr. Milton Muller. Isn't it a contradiction in terms to talk about sovereignty in global technical standards? Is it contradictory? You, you need interoperability, but, interoper but sovereignty doesn't mean no one can talk to each other. That would be useless. Like if, if, the, French, you know, if the French standards, if I couldn't use a website, because I, I'm only allowed to access, let's say, French websites in France, 
websites that are in French. I couldn't access English language websites. That would be ridiculous. It's the same with financial technologies. You know, the wonderful thing about the internet is that I can, in theory, doesn't matter, you know, if I if I want to access Wikipedia, I should be able to do it from Ethiopia, should be do it from should be able to do it from Syria, should be able to do it from the United States, and we all get the same level of access, the same content. And that's immensely empowering. This is done through standardizing the minimum necessary technical configurations. Uh, in order to empower people and, and spread their capabilities. So I don't think there is a contradiction there. The contradiction only happens when you have what's called imperialism. When you have countries, for example, the United States, or companies, let's say Google, I left the World of Web Consortium over digital rights management, force people to obey their particular standards. So for example, everyone here probably went through COVID, probably tried to watch movies, and it was very hard to prevent people from watching movies over the internet uh, until the uh, DRM got baked in digital rights management, which forces you to pay for the movie, doesn't, won't play the movie without that, got baked into uh, the HTML itself via the monopoly of Netflix and Google in terms of web standards. So, you know, that, that is, I think, functionally just imperialism and should be resisted. And I, I want to just talk a little bit, comment on what Andreas said. So I come from a technical standards background, used to work at W3C at MIT with Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, worked in the Internet Engineering Task Force, who we've been discussing Andreas's proposal with in what's called the Security Area uh, Applications Group. And, you know, the ITF, this is the organization that Vin Cerf and others kind of co-founded and worked in when they were young. And there are also people are interested in reviewing these standards. It's another way to get involved. But ultimately, the problem with the IETF is that it's, it is a good old boys club. It's a network of individuals, often somewhat old, often from the global north, and that it is probably more useful at this moment to try to get people from the global south involved via the ISO and ITU. I do want to look really quickly at what is what what is that what is it that the FATF and CBDCs are trying. Uh, to abolish. So let's say, let's grab uh, Ethiopian beer and you look at what's, you can also tell what's important to a country by looking at what's on their money, right? So you see it looks like a pretty happy group of people, I guess maybe different tribes or a family. Uh, you look at slightly larger denominations and you see nature, a bird of peace, obviously not having a good time right now in Ethiopia. Um, but if you look, you know, if you look at the US dollar, which is where I'm from, uh, you know, we claim, you know, to have abolished slavery, but we have slave masters on the dollar. We have people on the dollar. Now, I moved to Europe. I worked for the French government. If you look at what's on the euro, what is the, the picture of the thing on the euro? It's interesting. It's infrastructure. There's no people on the euro. You have bridges, right? Bridges and other kinds of kind of public works. This is, this is what the European Union br believe brings together Europe. And the future of what will bring together and empower people in the world is probably financial technology, not the control over bodies, not the control over the domain name system, which is a big topic here, has been for a very long time, but the control over finances. And we are faced, uh, you know, in a world where cash will be abolished, that's the plan, and it's either going to be abolished in such a way that there is essentially no privacy, that we have essentially a global surveillance apparatus, and that political dissidents, uh, which you know, are what brings society forward since uh, for hundreds of years, can have their uh, cash, their access to finances turned off. And it doesn't matter. In, in, in the way that the standards are currently set up, you know, the U.S. would turn those finances off. It doesn't matter if you're the president of Ecuador. It doesn't matter if you're an activist and lawyer from Guatemala. It doesn't matter if you're a normal person in Ethiopia. Um, and that's a very dangerous future, and very few people are paying attention to it. And despite all the talk about privacy from Europe, it's mostly nonsense. You can see the European governments themselves gave access to all financial data to the United States, rather, rather on purpose. So the only way forward I see uh, would be that if you know, people, in order to basically have control over their own lives, need to have control over their own money, over, the, over democratic control, over the creation and management of their own money. People should not probably be held hostage 
to the Fed, to the Federal Reserve, or the FATF. And that is as long as, you know, you may have a country leaving, their armies leaving your country, like the U.S. leaving Iraq. You may have the former colonialists, like France, leaving countries in Africa. But as long as the financial system is still controlled by these few powers, the people will never have freedom. And so in order to have freedom, we will have to control our own currencies, and that will involve a political struggle, which will take place in the realm of standards bodies, so we need people involved, and also in the realm of people just being active, refusing to use CBDCs if they violate privacy, pressuring their own governments, and getting into the streets. I don't think there's any other way that uh, we're going to survive the next 100 years uh, without that. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Any follow-up comment, Andres, on on this discussion? And yeah, I mean, uh, I I think uh, it's very important to uh, to, uh, to perhaps hear hear from everyone uh, as well. But um, the issue the issue of of money increasingly uh, in in the twenty first century is uh, more and more tied to technology. And we're seeing a tendency of uh, uh, emerging, basically, in de facto emerging of big uh, finance, big tech, and big government simultaneously. Okay, and if we don't have a overarching solution that can deal with uh, these issues uh, from a democratic, a, a a, f a, a perspective of basically liberation and that can sustain the progress of humanity, and we will be much closer to the Leviathan. Now, I do want to make a very key uh, distinction here. The problem is not what little or big or medium-sized surveillance that a small developing country can exert Right? One, because doesn't necessarily have all the tools to do that. Second, because it's not of systemic importance in terms of the world. It is important in terms of human rights of pe people and population. But we are talking about something many times bigger that de facto is uh, heading an extraterritorial mega surveillance of the entire planet's population that has access to money. That has access to money, which in the 21st century is access to basically electronic uh, accounts and, and systems. Now, small developing countries could design a system where the money that goes through the banking system and the electronic version of money can be taken advantage of with big data analytics and so on for policy making. And I think that's a, uh, an opportunity that has to be taken advantage of that has not been done because the data centers and the information is not even stored in our national countries, right? So data localization becomes an important issue as well. But that's very different from the legal tender type money, which is physical cash, and which will increasingly become central bank digital currencies which, on the other hand, requires protections embedded in the technology itself so that the human rights to privacy and uh, individual sovereignty can be guaranteed. That's uh, something that uh, I wanted to add as well. Thank you. So we will go ahead with questions from the audience. We, because we already give a space to the remote audience, we, I would like to give an opportunity to anyone here you want any to raise any question or comment uh, it would be great if you can raise your hand yes <coughs> anyone else to to do to i'm here now okay. thank you uh, first of all um i would like to appreciate um especially uh, having a united nation uh, uh, to uh, host ethiopia the 17th anniversary of 17th uh, intergovernment forum this is a historical uh, event, uh, as I see uh, from the lecture, from the presentation, the currently the world is in a currency war between the SWIFT system 
the current SWIFT system has to be changed. Uh, I just want to mention one question and then I'll have some. How can we move from using physical fiat currency to digital currency? There are three problems. I'm doing research in Australia at the moment. The first problem is the government continue printing physical fiat currency and bank not able to control those monies, which is physically. The second problem is the increasing activities of money laundering and illegal printing fake money. And also this is worldwide and nationwide. Based on these two problems, there's another problem. The third problem is the rapid advanced technology such as blockchain, as you said before, and NFC, NFT, AI, and quantum computing. Uh, based on this problem, we need to further analyze what we know and what we don't know. So for me, uh, there is a problem in the current system, as we see from the lecture, is that the United Nations have a plan to either modify the current system of the SWIFT, the current SWIFT, which is society, um, worldwide inter interbank financial telecommunication. So that's the current system at the moment working there, which is 800, 857 uh, national banks association at the um, current uh, level. For the current system, what we see now is after the uh, Ukraine war and then also the establishment of the BRICS and then other organization, I can list for you here. There is a group of countries such as in Africa, we have the Lion economy, which is Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, South Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana. So how we approach to change or modify the current system, I'm talking about the, uh, not talking about the privacy, all that, but how we save third world countries or south to south to include the current system which is driving by the north and the western countries. We need to put this world into a safe internet can govern for all of us, not the giant companies and developing countries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, please, um, who, who wants to respond to this one? I can take it. Yeah, I mean, the, it is a, a global monopoly. It's uh, SWIFT uh, is a, it's a private, it's a cooperative, but it's uh, owned by banks and uh, it's established in, in Brussels. It works under European Union regulation. Its information is exclusively shared with the United States. Okay, so it's clearly a, a what you would call a digital colonialism institution, uh, and in with a dish, with an additional level, which is that there's a money issue involved. Okay, uh, now SWIFT used to be known before uh, 2011, approximately, as a neutral global public good. Right, it was almost as good as the uh, international postal service. Right, so you could you would just send an email uh, or send a letter, and it would get there. Right, it was a, an international protocol for sending information, just like email. Now, uh, it's starting with the U.S. influence over the European Union. SWIFT was threatened to be sanctioned if they didn't pull out Iran from the SWIFT system, and that's how it started. And most recently, uh, after the, the Ukraine war against uh, 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 several institutions of the Russian Federation. But that's probably going to increase, not decrease, right? So they are weaponizing a global public good against uh, different or specific entities when it was supposed to be a neutral institution. So what we need is a resilient uh, design that allows for a, a international, a true global public good that can be 
governed, for example, in a multi-stakeholder framework, hopefully within the auspices of the United Nations, that can guarantee this neutrality, just like the International Postal Union, okay? which guarantees that if you send a letter, even in the countries that are at war between each other, that, that protocol, physical protocol of sending a letter and arriving to the other place uh, will occur. Uh, that uh, is a, a, an issue more of politics than technology, but we can uh, design in this international, uh, truly existing framework of technology, the protocols for that uh, to happen as well. Thank you. So um, let's go now for online and then and then for uh, in the room. Is there any other question online? There's no questions online. We will go to the room, please. What do you? Hi. Um, first of all, sorry I joined the session a little late. So this is something that may have already been addressed, but. Um, historically, something we've seen with technology and CBDC itself essentially being a technology is that there is often an efficiency slash um, scalability versus privacy trade-off that's involved. So, for example, if you look at search engines, what we've seen is that Google, even though it's not the most private search engine, continues to be the most popular among general citizens because it's able to deliver certain results. So, do you see a similar efficiency privacy trade-off being prevalent in the domain of CBDCs as well? And if that is the case, then how do we get the general populace to care about things like surveillance and privacy, which at least in emerging countries seem to be mostly at the back of uh, uh, an individual's mind when considering what sort of technology or platform to use. Yeah, so I think there, I'm just going to deal a little bit with the pri privacy aspect and the scalability aspect first. Um, but before doing that, I want to remind people why cryptocurrencies as such are kind of useful. So if I want to send money to someone in China, cryptocurrencies, due to somewhat the peer-to-peer -peer nature of that broadcast, are really hard to censor. So I can send money to someone in China today. No, I, I, mean, I do it all the time. So uh, same with, and you people typically back off to things like USD Tether for transactions. The reason is that the US, you know, due to its imperialism and due to the fact that it's a huge army is considered a stable, basically, uh, currency. There are al alternatives though, right? So you could imagine where, where's the real wealth of a nation? It's in things like, you know, commodities. And for example, uh, you know, food, wood, and we, I used to work at MIT with Sandy Pentland and we had a proposal called trade coin, which talked about how we could have commodity backed currencies. Okay. So a CBDC, unfortunately tends to combine the worst of both worlds. You combine, uh, unhindered money printing, right? Tied to a national currency, uh, that can be easily censored. So unlike Bitcoin, easily censored. Uh, unlike a commodity back thing, purely national. You know, I teach cryptocurrency in Beirut. It's a mess. Soon as you know the government starts overprinting and being opaque in their in their in their bank, you know your savings are wiped out. At least if you're middle class or poor, rich people can just pay back debts earlier. So this is a huge topic. Technically, though, it's not that complicated. Technically, what you need is you need a distributed ledger. Um, with agreement on how the money is printed, ideally democratically, agreement on what that money is. Maybe it's purely fiat. Maybe it's commodity backed. Maybe it's a mixture. You have proposals like the Bancor and other things out there, XDRs for years. And then in terms of privacy, privacy is actually there is somewhat of a scale, a scaling issue, but the scaling issue only is encountered when you try to store every transaction in the blockchain itself. Slightly better designs, I would look, for example, the liquid Blockstream's liquid design, basically say that the whole point of a blockchain is to keep things transparent. So everyone knows who's printing money and who's getting money. And some of that information should be public, right? And that's what you might want to store in the blockchain. Then you have a, a, another concept, we have side chains, which could store private data, or even better, offline eCash. That's the design that Switzerland's going with and some of their CBDC work. That's the design my company is working on. We'll print it. I can be happy to share. It's called offline eCash. But effectively, it works like cash. You would use the blockchain simply to monitor the transfers between different, you know, the central bank and the other banks 
in the country. But when it gets down to the level of individuals, it doesn't make sense to put your transactions on a blockchain. It makes sense that you get essentially some form of e-cash that's completely private that can be stored on your phone. And that, you know, those transactions take milliseconds. Uh, I'm happy to share the exact stats with you afterwards. But we think that the technology exists to do this work properly. What does not exist currently is the political will. And the political will doesn't exist because no one knows all the stuff at FATF is happening, except Andreas, basically. Um, any other question from remote or uh, from the audience now? If there's no questions, I would like to ask a question not only to the speakers, but also to the audience. Obviously, one of the issues that we saw here is that these spaces are not in our imagination in the internet governance community. It's not something that we are looking up. It's not, some, not a, a room that we are entering. It's complex, it's technical, it's tricky. So the question that I have both for the speakers and the audience is how can we open this process? How can we be more alert of what's going on in these or organisms? How can we fund it? How can we elevate the skills and the capacities? How can we get up to speed? So be, to be a critical community watching the process, so we make sure that it's not only serving the interests of few companies and funders, but it's serving people. And open to comments and also not people who already spoke, uh, open <laughs> and open also to comments from, from the speakers. Um. Well, I think uh, there, there are many spaces, right, uh, where we have to uh, uh, try to monitor what, what's going on and then uh, translate, right? Because the first step is engaging the people and the communities to gain interest in these issues. And uh, trust me, uh, f for engagement purposes, there are enough scandalous <laughs> items to grab the attention. So I think there are enough attention grabbers here that, that uh, uh, we can uh, share with, with the community. Uh, but primarily in the duty of understanding that uh, this, this is a, an area of uh, absolutely strategic interest to you know, not only sovereign governments in the global south and in the developing world, uh, but also in uh, communities that in general are concerned about their uh, economic uh, future and their human rights. Uh, but I'd, I'd love to hear from, from people in the audience too, yeah. Sorry, um, if anyone can, if anyone can add, you can. I have to be listened. But if not, I have to say something. Uh, as I said before, um, we need to make peace global society. The global society has to connect it together uh, by the internet inclusiveness. To do this, we need to equip the human resource. All what we do now is, as we hear, most of the developed countries, private investors, is doing what they're doing. Three, months, three weeks ago, they pulled $150 billion to put cryptocurrency down. I'm sure you heard all of them. Now they pull again if tomorrow we don't know what happened. What are the intrinsic value of the fiat currency and digital currency? We need to equip each government in the south or the north or the west or the east. Actually, the uh, global community has to advocate the advanced countries. They created this advanced technology they invest huge amount of money for the uh, technology and the uh, uh, tools. So they have to deliver and give to the benefit for the South South. At the end of the day, we live together in the world. So no one been a winner. We saw the last two months what happened in Ukraine. So what we need to do, we need to cooperate each other. We need to help each other not take 
let us learn give and take for our benefit and the globalization of internet for a peaceful, stable, accurate, and sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last question, um, because it's, oh, great. Another question. We have still time to two questions. Thank you. I'm Luis Fernando Castro, I'm from Brazil. I've been a former member of a Brazilian steer internet steering committee. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a lawyer and I'm responsible to represent the CGI in University of Sao Paulo in a special uh, share that we created to discuss these issues. I'm surprised to listen to this event and th in this small event, such an interesting uh, subject that I, I cannot follow it completely because there are many information, many names that I don't know. But uh, when we go to the main session and we listen to the same principles, the same ideas, same uh, uh, desires, uh, uh, I feel frustrated to come to, to the IGF. But when I listen to such an interesting uh, point like this, with very, very objective and important and relevant uh, consequences, I've, I asked myself, uh, I will, will talk to you, I will talk to you to try to, to go further in this discussion, maybe in the university uh, with a steering committee, because I think that that's the point. Uh, we, I regret that most of the time we discuss in uh, European or North American ambience, and we don't uh, go straight to the point. We are just discussing uh, like a theater when the main things are uh, discussed in other places. You talked about Snowden and we all know what happened to him uh, when he brought this information for the society. Well, I will make, I, I thank you, I congratulate the, your initiative and I will take contact with you to try to, to get further information or to propose any discussion in in the place of the university and with the CGI. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will. Do you have also a comment? Uh, Please go ahead. Yes, my name is Johannes from Germany, um, and maybe my lack of knowledge and the context of the discussion might actually point to something, because I'm wondering um, between. I, I want to make a distinction between the political and the technical. So the political problems and discussions and the technical solutions and the design of how to proceed with a maybe more just financial system. Uh, so I'm wondering, should the technical solution and maybe um, I was actually hesitant to going here because of the word blockchain and because what I have in mind when I hear the word blockchain. Uh, so what should proceed? Should the political, how to how do we design the political forum for this discussion or should we have the technical uh, solution at hand to show to political leaders? I mean. Harry or? So, so again, technical discussions are actually political, right? That's. When, when And let's think about this. Let's say I build a CBDC. The U.S. already has one. It's called Open CBDC. Uh, it's like this different designs, but they have at least one. And they have one piece of software. And Russia, I was there a few years ago, they have another piece of software. China has a, th a third. Countries like Ethiopia, I mean, you're in a, it's going to be a classic situation of cyber colonialism. Whose software are you going to choose, right? You're going to choose the American software, Chinese software, Russian software. Why can't, you know, you build your own software? And the Ethiopia has great universities, great programmers, probably could. But again, the point of going through an open process based on standards where the politics are kind of on the table is that the goal would be that countries can build their own software, that they, if they do so, they will not be exiled from the financial system. And countries can have, as I think you mentioned, south to south money transfers without everything being routed through like a database in, uh, in, uh, in North America, which is completely crazy from, if you just think about it for a second. There was once a, f a famous joke by Julian Assange where he said, uh, you know, Putin can't even buy a Coca-Cola without the United States knowing. And uh, that's true for all of us, unfortunately. Um, we, are going to, we, uh, uh, we still have one question and we really need it. Um, 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 to
close because we have like one minute, zero minutes almost left. So we will go ahead with quickly the online question and then wrap up and then we are available outside for follow up comments. Over to you, Amel Amelia, or whoever is. We asking. have, uh, yeah, we have one question uh, from Matti Adegari. Uh, so please, yeah, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to every participant. Thank you to give me the floor. Uh, and thank you for interesting and helpful uh, discussion of this topic. My name is Mahdi Adigiri. I'm from the private sector of Iran, and I'm a researcher in the field of new technology. Uh, when uh, my question is, uh, when uh, we regulate the uh, central bank digital currency or central bank cryptocurrency in the international level, we increase the monitoring of the finan uh, financial institute of a country at the international level. Okay, so when there are fewer nodes in the less development uh, uh, country, it means that the more control in with the people and group that, the, that have uh, more at stake in case such as uh, proof of stake consensus mechanisms. Uh, you know, access to the financial data can be given to a legal or national person with the agreement of the network member in a blockchain. Then more, uh, most of the member of the network are from developed, uh, developing uh, country and powerful country. How are the rights of developing country or less developed country respect in the blockchain? How can we have a freedom uh, in our financial system and have a production of uh, financial sovereignty. Uh, thank you to giving me the floor. Thank you so much. Um, who wants to answer the question? I can answer the question. I think it's too complicated. So, so again, I don't, I don't think we're, people are imagining like a single giant blockchain running everyone's financial transactions. That might be the only possible system that would be worse than the system we have today. Uh, what I think people are hoping for, if you wanted like a sovereign uh, system, is that effectively different countries, regions, even cities or individuals could each all have their own kind of financial uh, blockchain or e-cash system that doesn't involve a blockchain, and that these could interoperate with each other so that you could, like, for example, uh, in Bitcoin, if miners don't vote for your mine your transaction that gets put in the mempool. If it's not if it's not put in the chain, it gets kicked out. That's some form of censorship. We we similarly in a in a in a kind of financial system, you wouldn't want like a majority of countries have to vote on every transaction. That's crazy. You should be able to do your transactions and then record as needed and share as needed using open standards, perhaps produced by ISO. Um, Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that uh, the, the fact that you can have open uh, standards, open uh, source technology uh, is an opportunity for sovereignty uh, because it allows a, a society uh, to, to modify it, update it, uh, to uh, make it more adequate for your own needs uh, while still preserving the interoperable aspects that are deemed and necessary to to talk of with the rest of the world so yeah i think uh in the case of money it's no different uh, we have a, a huge opportunity here uh, and just another emph point of emphasis which is where the data is located right so do not forget that when you use one of the international credit cards that data of the transaction is not stored in local data centers in, in servers in your own country. It is by default stored in the data centers that are in one country in the world, which is the US. So the huge influence of those credit card networks uh, around the world allows for uh, non-sovereignty, but rather digital colonialism, mega surveillance of the entire planet's financial transactions, which can be easily, very easily, derived into behavioral surveillance, as Renata said earlier, right? So if you know how much I spend, where I spend, and what sort of stuff I'm buying, 
he know basically everything about me. So we have to be very aware about you know data localization and the fact that that data is being harvested and being uh, used with big data analytics, but not by you know your bank or your country or your government, but one government, one intelligence agency around the world that has access to all of that. Well, thank you so much for your time. I hope to see you in Japan next year. We continue the conversation and hopefully we, we would have advanced our participation and make the process more open and make the technology more ours in this uh, challenge of uh, changing and transforming the finance system. And, and thank you to the speakers and thank you to the online moderator. Uh, see you in the next sessions. See you around. <laughs>